ever find yourself scrolling through headlines about like global unrest and you just you can't shake this feeling of is this it is this like the beginning of the end oh yeah well you're not alone definitely not today we're taking a deep dive into a topic that's both fascinating and I think really timely biblical prophecy. Dude, why? Specifically, the 70 weeks prophecy found in the book of Daniel. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, and it's a prophecy that's like captured imaginations for centuries. For sure, for sure. You know, what's so interesting about it, I think, is that it doesn't just lay out, you know, some vague future. Right. It actually seems to sync up with historical events in a way that makes you kind of go, hold on a minute. Yeah, yeah. When I first heard about this, I was, I have to admit, I was pretty skeptical. Uh -huh. But then I started, you know, digging into it a little bit. And I have to admit, some of these connections are kind of wild. For this deep dive, we're drawing from a podcast we listened to with these two hosts, Pedro and Anna. And I thought they really broke it down in an accessible way. They're good. Yeah, they're very clear. Yeah, they're really great. And they start by highlighting the fact that this prophecy was delivered to Daniel by the angel Gabriel himself. Whoa. We're not just talking about some, you know, random prediction here. No. This is presented as like a direct message from God outlining kind of a timeline for his plan, especially concerning the Jewish people. Okay, so let's let's get into the specifics here. This whole 70 weeks thing, it's not literal weeks, is it? No, not at all. Okay. Think of it more like 70 periods of seven years Never. each. So each week represents seven years, which means we're dealing with a timeline of 490 years total. And 490 years, that's that's a long time. And this prophecy is covering all of that. It does. And here's how it kind of breaks down. The prophecy is divided into three main parts, seven weeks, then 62 weeks, and finally, one very, very interesting week all by itself. What gets really interesting is that the first two parts, those first 69 weeks, many scholars believe have already happened. Why? And they align with historical events in a remarkable way. Okay. All right. You got to you got to give us the details. What events are we talking about? Sure. So the first seven weeks, which would be 49 years, correspond to the time period when Jerusalem was being rebuilt after the Babylonian exile. Okay. We're talking about the years around, you know, 457 BC when King Artaxerxes issued a decree to allow the Jewish people to return and rebuild their temple and city. So that's that's the first seven weeks. What about the next 62? Buckle up. Okay. Because this is where it gets really, really compelling. Those 62 weeks or 434 years get us right up to a pivotal moment in history. Yeah. The arrival of Jesus. Wait, are you saying that this prophecy pinpoints the exact time that Jesus arrived on the scene? That's what many scholars believe. Wow. If you calculate those 69 weeks from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, uh -huh. it leads you right to the time when Jesus entered Jerusalem in triumph, just days before his crucifixion. That is absolutely wild. So we've got this timeline laid out centuries in advance. Right. And it seems to be lining up with, like, major historical events. Yeah. But what about that final week, that 70th week? Yeah. What's the deal with that? So we've got 69 weeks down, one to go. Right. And it sounds like this last week is a pretty major one. It is. What did Pedro and Anna have to say about that 70th week? Well, this is where things get, I think, even more interesting. Uh -huh. They explained that many scholars believe there's actually a gap between the 69th and 70th week. A gap. A gap, yeah. Think of it like um, a movie intermission, right? Okay. You had the rising action. You've reached the climax. Right. And now there's a pause before the final act. Okay. Okay. They believe we're in that pause right now. Wow. What they call the age of the church. Okay, so that final seven-year period is still out there waiting to happen. Right. And that's where all the end times talk comes in, right? Exactly. Okay. This final seven-year period, that 70th week, is associated with some pretty intense events. Okay. Daniel describes things like um, a time of great tribulation, mm -hmm. a period of global turmoil and hardship mm -hmm. described in the book of Revelation. Right. And the rise of a figure known as the Antichrist who you know, deceives many and leads rebellion against God. Wait, so they're saying the Antichrist, the tribulation, all of that is still to come. Right. Sometime after this gap in the prophecy. That's how they interpret it. Yeah. And they're not alone. Wow. Daniel actually gets pretty specific about this 70th week. Okay. He mentions a treaty that's made, you know, with many nations. Right. But then it's broken halfway through the seven year period. Oh, wow. Leading to, you know, intense persecution, especially for those who follow God. And Pedro and Anna connected this to what's happening in the world right now. They did. That's a pretty unsettling thought. 
Yeah. What what kind of connections did they make? Well, for starters, they pointed out um, how significant it is that Israel became a nation again in 1948. Right. You see, the prophecy speaks of a like a regathering of Israel before the final seven years. Okay. And this lines up with that, with the, you know, kind of unlikely reestablishment of Israel as a nation in 1948 yeah. after centuries of dispersal. Yeah. It's a detail that gives a lot of people pause. Right. Because this whole prophecy centers around the Jewish people and Jerusalem. It does. So seeing Israel become a nation again after all that time, it's almost like a, like a piece of the puzzle falling into place. Precisely. Yeah. And then they talked about, you know, how the world stage seems increasingly focused on Israel in the Middle East, right. which of course aligns with, you know, this prophecy's emphasis on that region. Yeah. They also brought up, um, you know, the push for global solutions, things like, you know, unified government and economic systems, which right. we're hearing more and more about these days. Wait, so they're saying the creation of like the United Nations could be connected to this ancient prophecy. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely a thought provoking connection. That's mind blowing. Yeah. And then of course, there are the, you know, more unsettling trends like, you know, the rise in natural disasters, yeah, yeah. the the increase in global conflicts. Yeah. Even, you know, the growing persecution of Christians in some parts of the world. Right. Pedro and Anna presented these as potential indicators that, you know, we're moving closer to that 70th week. Wow. I mean, on the one hand, it's easy to dismiss this as just, you know, sure. reading too much into current events. Right. Yeah. But on the other hand. The fact that the first part of the prophecy lined up so perfectly with history right. it makes you wonder. It certainly does. Yeah. And while Pedro and Anna acknowledge that, you know, the idea of this final seven year period can be overwhelming. Right. They emphasize that it's not about living in fear. I have to admit, it's a lot to process. All this talk of tribulation and, you know, a final seven years. Yeah. It can feel pretty heavy, even overwhelming. I hear you. It's easy to get caught up in, you know, the more intense aspects of this prophecy. But Pedro and Anna were very clear that it's not meant to, like, paralyze us with fear. Right. It's about understanding what might be coming and preparing ourselves spiritually. So it's more about awareness and discernment, not panicking about every headline. Right. Or trying to predict, you know, the exact date the world is going to end. Exactly. They emphasize that um, the most important thing is to be rooted in faith not fear, to remember that even in the midst of potential upheaval, yeah. there's hope. Because ultimately, this prophecy points to something positive, right? It does. The return of Jesus, mm -hmm. the establishment of his kingdom. Right. It's easy to get you know, fixated on the challenging times that might be ahead. Yeah. But this prophecy isn't just about the end. It's about what comes after. Right. A new era of peace and, and God's reign. It's a powerful reminder that even when... You know, things feel uncertain. Yeah. There's a bigger picture, a larger plan at play. Absolutely. And I think that's what makes this prophecy so compelling. You know, even thousands of years after it was written. Right. It speaks to something, I think, deep within us, this this longing for meaning and purpose. Yeah. For a hope that that goes beyond just the chaos of the world. It's like it's like we're all living in this story, yeah. this grand narrative that's been unfolding for centuries. Right. And we have a part to play. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. We're not just, you know, passive bystanders. Right. We have the opportunity to choose how we respond to these times. Right. To choose faith over fear and to live in a way that that reflects the hope we have in something bigger than ourselves. This has been such an eye-opening deep dive. Yeah. I feel like I have a whole new perspective on this, this ancient prophecy and what it might mean for us today. Me too. It's amazing how these, you know, ancient texts can feel so incredibly relevant to the world we live in right now. Totally. Totally. So to wrap things up, we've got this prophecy divided into three parts. The rebuilding of Jerusalem, the arrival of Jesus, and then this this gap, this age of the church that we might be living in right now with wow. that final seven years potentially still to come. And what's truly remarkable is is how accurately the first two parts of the prophecy seem to have come true. Right, right. Which begs the question. If those first two parts were so spot on. Right. How much weight should we give to what it says about the future? Yeah. That's something I'll definitely be pondering. Me too. It's <laughs> a question worth wrestling with. Yeah. A question that invites us to examine, you know, our own life. Right. Our own beliefs and, and the hope we place in something beyond ourselves. It's a lot to think about, but in a good way. It's yeah. given me a new lens through which to view the world and the events unfolding around us. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we're all searching for, you know? 
a sense of understanding, a sense of purpose, a reason to hope. This prophecy, as complex and even unsettling as it can be, offers, I think, a glimpse of that, a reminder that even in the midst of uncertainty, there's a bigger story being told. Absolutely. It's a story that's still being written, okay. and we each have a role to play. And on that note, we'll leave you to ponder that. Yes. This has been The Deep Dive. Thanks for joining us.